Welcome back. This is lecture 13, part 3, and let's continue our discussion where we were looking at, on the point number 3, the church scattered missionary beginnings in Judea and Samaria. And if you recall, the last time that I had mentioned this to you, and that was that the book of Acts is the unfolding and the unpacking of the Great Commission in the birth and the growth of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's pick up where we left off the last time, and we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 19 to 22, and we're going to be at point F, the beginning of Paul's witness, a believer's life and testimony, and here's where we begin to see uh, here in this great section of scripture where it tells us in verse 19, and now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus and immediately began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the Son of God. And then we move on to the next section, which is going to be the foretaste of Paul's great suffering. He gets a glimpse into how he's going to suffer, and in spite of that, he, uh, he is faithful despite all of the terrible, terrible trials and tribulations that he goes through, and that starts in verse 23 to verse 30. And remember, we're being prepared for the fact of the matter is that as witnesses, we will suffer persecution. We, in, we do live in a Christless and evil world. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the problems of the church today is that we're constantly seeking to be delivered from evil. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, because we've taken <coughs> that verse in the in the in the model prayer to the extent that we want to be liberated from this world. Yet that would be a contradiction because the Lord's prayer in John chapter 17 said it was, I ask not that they be removed, but the Father, but that you would take care of them while they remain here and that you would protect them. And so we, you know, some, we need to comprehend that we're not to be delivered from evil, from an evil Christless society. We are to, we are to dwell in that society and be a light salt and a witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do see that in the midst of that, we are going to encounter all kinds of grave difficulties and even death. We're told in 1923, it says this, and Paul escapes with his death, escapes death at this point. And it says in verse 23, and when many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. They were looking to kill him. And we know that this section ends because uh, they help him escape. In verse 30 it says, but when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. This is, this is the reality. Our people need to comprehend this reality. Uh, this next section is the state of the church. The state of the church, what a church should be. Uh, it is laid out for us in verse 31. Look what he says um, in Acts 19.31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. Look at the distinct cultural differences and political differences right, that existed in these three areas. Judea, it says Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. And we see a tremendous impact of the gospel witness. We get a point number four, and the church scattered, the first great mission to the Gentiles, and now this is Peter. Peter begins to unpack his missionary journeys. He has a much broader ministry, uh, remember, in Lydia, and making men whole. You see this in verse 32. <clears throat> the account now reverts back to Peter. Look at verse 32. And now as Peter was traveling through all the regions, came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda, and they met a found named Aenus, who has been bedridden for eight years, for he was paralyzed and we know exactly what takes place there uh, because in verse 35 it says um, and um, verse 34 and Peter said Jesus Christ heals you get up and make your bed immediately he got up and all who lived in litter and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord so notice this <clears throat> the whole purpose of that miracle was to drive them and to turn <clears throat> and to make sure that they were turned to the Lord Jesus Christ and then we had in Joppa, he goes to Joppa from there, and, and, and he continues to conquer death there. We see it in verse 36. You remember the story of Dorcas? It says here <clears throat> in verse 36, now in Joppa there was a disciple named T Tabitha, which translated in Greek is, is called Dorcas. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, and she, con and she continually did. And it happened that at the time she fell sick and died, and when they had washed her body, they laid up in the upper room. 
and now we know <clears throat> this story continues to the end, and, and look what happens in verse um, 40. And Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed and turned to the body. She said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Look at verse 40, 42. It became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. And so we see now, we know the story and forget the purpose. <clears throat> it's the proclamation of the gospel, and the Great Commission continues to expand as being played out completely and, and as being woven in and out of all of these various stories in the book of Acts. Then we get to ver chapter 10, and now this section from verse 1 to verse 33 is we have this worldwide ministry now begins to go and moves beyond the bounds of Judaism, beyond the bounds of of, of the Jews, and it begins to move in a much broader way, and so we get the point D, a worldwide ministry in Caesarea, okay, and here's where he begins to see this, uh, breaking down the prejudices that exist between the different groups of people, and we see this how, when he sends, when Cornelius sends a delegation to Peter, right, uh, verse 1, now there was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion that, <clears throat> what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man, and one who feared God with all his household, and gave many alms to the Jewish people and pray to God continually and we know the story we get we know the story of Peter's vision there um, we know he gets summoned to Caesarea right and we know that Peter meets uh, Cornelius for uh, finally okay and then Peter preaches in Cornelius house if you remember that <clears throat> okay? and we and we know and we see great powers display and people come to the Lord Jesus Christ here and look what he says at the end of this section here in 1040 God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible he's preaching the gospel not all the people but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God that is to us who ate and drank with him and arose from the dead look at verse 42 1042 and he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that is the one who has been appointed by God as a judge of the living and the dead and of him and all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. So we see, notice the structure of the book. Notice the flow of the book. It's continuously, continuously the proclamation of the gospel. The church is birth. The church is growing. The church is suffering. The church is going to, to, to great persecution. The individual witnesses are also suffering, going to great persecution. And yet through all of that, God is with them and he's being glorified. <clears throat> we see a uh, continuing point F, a worldwide ministry in Caesarea. And now we have the impact of Pentecost again in the okay, in the receiving of the Holy Spirit, and we see this in verses 44 to 48. Look at this. <clears throat> and while Peter was still, uh, and this is where the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles. Remember that uh, day of Pentecost, it was upon the Jews, and we see it here, and he says, and while Peter was still speaking these words in verse 44, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to what? To the message, the gospel. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed. Now the Jews are amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Amen? And we see this. So now we see this, 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 Senate Pen this second Pentecost, if you will, being unfolded. And then we have point F, a worldwide ministry in Caesarea, gaining a worldwide vision. Now they begin to see it. We need to expand. Remember the Great Commission? You, know, you should go into all the world, right? And, and it tells us very clear, the great man making disciples, right? And it's very clear into all the world. Remember uh, Acts 1, 8, he tells us very clearly, you know, into Judea and Samaria and to the, and to the remotest part of the world. Right? So we see this expansion taking place here in chapter 11. Look at what happens in verse um, 1 through 18. Uh, and how, how do we see this? We see this by Peter defending God's grace. This is, how, uh, the, this is how he cast the worldwide vision that the gospel needs to be proclaimed everywhere. He says in verse 1, chapter 11, Now the apostles and the brethren who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also received the word. And then when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were, who, who were circumcised took issue with him. They took, they, took, they took issue with him on this, saying, You went to the uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began to speaking and proceeded to explain to them in orderly sequence, saying, I was in the city of Joppa and he relates everything, precisely what takes place. And then you see, drop down to verse 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. Talk about the day of Pentecost. 
and I remember the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John, baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now he sees the fulfillment of the prophecy. Therefore, if God gave to them the same gift as he gave to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? And when they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, Well, then God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. And now we have the, the walls of division are coming down. They're coming down. We get now to point five, which is the church scattered. And, that's, and it shows us and demonstrates clearly God's sovereignty over the church. We can see this with great clarity. Uh, we see it here starting in verse 19. Um, and it goes all the way to chapter 12, verse 25. This entire section here is just demonstrating and revealing and manifesting the sovereignty of God. How? Well, point A, the first great Gentile church, God's pattern for all churches. Now here's the pattern that's laid out for us. Look at verse 19. Now this is the pattern for the church. Look at verse 19. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. So notice this. They break out from Jews only, the circumcised, to the uncircumcised, to Gentiles. And in that the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. We have massive evangelism and witnessing taking place here. Look at verse 22. And the news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. They see that church is being planted, is now beginning to grow. And then in verse 23, and then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with the resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. And we see this just break out completely. And then as a result, remember Judea was going through great difficulty. Look at verse 27. And now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. We can see, we can begin to see this here. Um, <clears throat> We see this where, where uh, the church is now beginning to, to, to go through great problems here and relief comes. And then look at chapter 12. Chapter 12. The Jerusalem church is miraculously protected. It's about to be persecuted and annihilated. Okay? And God's pattern for deliverance from the persecution. He lays it out for it. I don't know why we panic. We're in God's almighty hands. So chapter 12, uh, Herod's violence um, uh, to the church. He, begins, he brings his wave of of violence toward the church. Uh, look at verse uh, 1. And now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on those who, on some who belonged to the church in order to what? To mistreat them very clearly here. We see this persecution and um, we even see here in um, uh, in verse 4, and, uh, we actually verse 3, and when he saw it that he pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. He gets, Peter's arrested, he's sent to prison, okay? They go pray, the, the people begin to pray, remember that? Look at verse 5, so Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by what? By the church to God. And then in verse 6, we see on the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between the two soldiers bound with chains and guards in front of him and the doors watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in the light and shone in the cell. And what happened? Look what he says. And Peter, and, 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 and he says, and he struck Peter's side and woke him up and said, get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And he's set free. And this entire chapter... <clears throat> No, it's dealing with how the persecution against the church and it's in vivid color, in detail, but it also shows the hand of God, the sovereignty of God. <clears throat> uh, drop down to verse 20. Now it says here, talk about um, Herod's, now, now, now Herod has to encounter God. <clears throat> because we find here in verse 20. Now he was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and with one accord they came to him, and having won over Blastus to King Chamberlain, they were asking for peace because their country was fed by the king's country. And on an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal power, took his seat in the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. Now this, he's talking to them. Now look, look what happens. And the people kept crying out, the voice of a God and not of a man. <coughs> Can you imagine that? This is the people. This is the voice of a God and not of a man. And then immediately, you want to talk about blaspheming the name of God in the presence of God? Look at this. 
and they kept, and the people kept crying out the voice of a God and not of a man. And then in verse 23, and immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and died right in front of them. But look at the impact, verse 24. Notice the structure of the, of the book of Acts. Notice how it continues. To look at the impact. It's always evangelism. It's always witnessing. It's always the church and it's growing. Look at verse 24. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be what? Multiplied. To be multiplied. Amen? Then we get to, ver we get to chapter 13. We get to the next section here. This will be point six, the first great mission of Paul to the Gentiles, to Cyprus and Galatia. Now we've moved on from Peter, and now we get on to Paul, and we begin to see this, and it covers from Acts 13, chapter 1, all the way to Acts 14, verse 28. And we see point eight, the first missionaries, Barnabas and Paul, the most challenging call ever that was ever given. Look at this. In the first three verses, it says in chapter 13, now there was an Antioch in the church that there was prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian and who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting and the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And we have a unique call of God coming to take place here. Look at, uh, they go on to the Cyprus island. They go to preach in Cyprus. We see this starting in verse 4. And I'll go all the way to about verse 13 here. <clears throat> and we see that the beginning of the missions in evangelism from the part of Paul here. It says now in verse uh, 4, And so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their helper. We see this here. Um, laid out very, very, very clearly here for us. Um, it is just, it's quite unique, okay? And then we see that it, the, word, the Word of God is being translated for them, and we get down to verse 12, and then the proconsul believed that he saw it, and what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Look at this. It doesn't say he was amazed at the miracles of the Lord, even though miracles are taking place. He said at the teaching of the Lord. Then you get down to verse 13, 13, 13, okay? And we can see there from down to verse 14, um, all the way to about, let's see, through this entire section toward the end, somewhere around about verse 40, 41, somewhere in this whole section of scripture here, we have Antioch of Pisidia, we have the main city of the south of Galatia, the preaching, Paul begins to preach there in the southern part of Galatia, all through the, uh, the end of uh, chapter 13, and then we get to about verse 42, uh, we begin to see here uh, in Antioch of Pisidia as well, we see uh, uh, and we see various responses to the gospel. There's all kinds of funny responses that begin to respond here. And we see it from starting in verse 42 to the end of the chapter to verse um, 52. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, of the, out, the people kept begging that these things that might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. And now when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them were urging them to continue in the grace of God. I mean, that, there is now a hunger. Uh, the, the light, the fire has been ignited here. And we see all kinds of different responses. Um, for example, in verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord as many had been appointed to eternal life believed. You see this? Look at verse 52. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because they're seeing now the church continues to grow. It's growing. It's now growing exponentially is what's taking place here. Then we get to the next section, and when they go to Iconium, which is an ancient city, and God's pattern for preaching and witnessing, notice again, the pattern for preaching and witnessing. Now, we've seen it up until this time four different times, the different patterns that are, that are clearly demonstrated in the scriptures in the book of Acts. You see the structure of the book, how it's laid out for us. Now, in chapter 14, we see this in the first seven verses alone. And in Iconium, and in Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of the Greeks. Look at this. And it goes all the way to the end of that section. And look at verse 7. And there they continued what? 
to do miracles? No. It says to preach the gospel, to preach the gospel. Then from there they go to Lystra, which is a frontier town, and preaching to a heathen and superstitious people. We see this from chapter uh, 14, verse 8. Okay, uh, It says that Lystra man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. And this man was listening to Paul, and as he spoke, who, when he had fixed his gaze on him and seen that he had faith to be me well, he said a loud voice, stand right up on your feet, and he leaped up and began to walk. And we see this. Now, we know the story. We know the story and we get excited about it because look down to verse 14. And when the apostles of Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out because now they were, be, they were, be, they were being glorified by the people as gods. And they said, no, we're not. We're not one of those things, you know. But look at this. This just continues to, to expand, okay, exponentially. Um, look at the verse 19. But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. You know, they attacked him because what? The word of God is exploding. It's exploding here. Verse 20. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city the next day, and he went away with Barnabas and Derby. Why? Because he went on to preach. Look at verse 21. And after they had preached the gospel to that city, they made many disciples and returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. I mean, the guy gets beaten up, knocked down. He's bleeding. Okay? He gets up and goes back to preaching. Okay? And we see this expanding here. Um, he's in Derby now. He returns to the journey now. He, he doesn't run from them. And so here, and now he begins to talk about how the churches are actually made strong. And we see this from verse 21 to 28. <clears throat> he says, um, look at 22. Uh, strengthening the souls of disciples, encourage them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And look at verse 20, uh, 27. And when they arrived and they gathered the church together, they began to report all things that had God had done with them and how they had opened the door of faith in Gentiles. And they spent a long time with the disciples that were strengthening and discipling them and strength each and every single one of them. So you see, again, the pattern. You see how the pattern is laid of the book and how it's structured. <clears throat> we're so caught up on the miracles, we forget the purpose of the miracles. we caught up on the signs. And, and at every turn, you see, it's always the word being preached, being proclaimed, and being expanded throughout the kingdom. Then we get on to point number seven, the great Jerusalem council. Paul's mission is called into question. Why? Because now they're not expecting the numbers that are there coming in. These are astronomical numbers that are coming, people getting saved. And then there's a problem. It arises, okay? Two questions about salvation explode. Now we begin to get into a fight, church fight. Look at this in chapter 15. There's conflict over circumcision, right? Uh, it says in uh, the first five verses, some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Here we go on to church tradition and so forth. And this fight, this is, we have these kinds of fights in the church today. And we have all kinds of crazy things. Let us go back to the scriptures and see what God has to say to us. Welcome back, Lecture 13. There's going to be Part 4. We're looking at the Great Jerusalem Council here in Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 35. Um, Paul's mission gets called into question, and actually what this chapter is dealing with is now an argument about salvation. Isn't that argument continue today? Does it not continue today? You know, some people teach you that you cannot be saved without speaking in tongues. Some will teach you you cannot be saved without doing this, without be doing that, so forth and so forth. It was no different back then. <clears throat> in this case, they tell them that they had to be circumcised. Look at this. And so in the first five verses here, this conflict comes up. And, it's, uh, and this is a conflict within the church. This is within the church, and this is usually where these conflicts arise. And then we get to point B, the Jerusalem Council meets. The great declaration of salvation takes place here. <clears throat> Look at verse 6. They've heard the arguments have been laid out for them. Now look at verse 6. And the apostles and the elders came together to look at this matter. And after there had been much, been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days that God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. Because now they were arguing. That, that, that was a whole argument. It, it had to do with the, gen, uh, the Gentiles. And we can see this being laid out very clearly for us here. <clears throat> look at verse... Um, 19. 
Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they may abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from that which is strangled and from blood and from, and from Moses from in ancient generations has in every city those who preach him since he is read in, in, in the synagogues in, uh, he says, every Sabbath. Then we get a, we finally get an official decree. Hmm. There's a formal decree issued by the council, and it's the decree on salvation. And this is verse 23 to 35, and I want to take and read it because I, it is beyond me. I am baffled, okay, as to how is it that we don't seem to comprehend salvation. <clears throat> it is an official declaration. You see, <clears throat> look what he says starting in verse 22. Here's the decree. <clears throat> Then it seemed good to the apostles, it says, and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren, and that they sent this letter to them. <clears throat> Here's the letter. The apostles and the brethren who are elders to the brethren in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia who are from the Gentile greetings. So we have a Jewish council writing now to a Gentile council, and he says this. Since we have heard that some of our number to whom we gave no instruction have disturbed you with their word, unsettling your souls. Hello, that's a clue, right? We got believers, some of our believers, they're zealous, they're excited for the things of Jesus Christ, but they have no instruction. And they disturbed you. And he says, since we have heard that some of you, of our number to whom we have gave no instruction, have disturbed you with their soul, with their words, unsettling. So they, 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 they did this on their own. It seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's establishing the credibility of this delegation. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon no greater burden than these essentials. And here's the essentials, the essentials of the gospel of salvation that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you, will, you would do well. You would do, you would do well, and he says, for well. Simple. Just stay to the essentials, right? And the only requirements they had for them were these little things. They were little things. They, 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 these weren't big things, okay? Look at this in verse 30. So when they, went, when they were sent away, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter, and when they had read it, they rejoiced because of this encouragement. Judas and Silas also being prophets themselves encouraged and strengthened the brethren with a lengthy message. They preached a long message. And after they had spent time there, they were sent away from the brethren in peace to those who had sent them out. But it seemed good to Silas to remain there. But Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, teaching and preaching with many others also the word of the Lord. Notice again, the word is prominent and is preeminent throughout this entire section. We get to the next section here in the middle of chapter 15. And we're going to go from verse 36, Acts 15, 36, and go all the way to Acts chapter 18. <clears throat> and this is going to be point number eight, the second great mission of Paul to the Gentiles now going to Europe. And, and this is what, now look at this, point A, the journey begins in controversy in a study, and, that, and this is a study on honest conflict. Look at that, and, and, and a real conflict arises, okay? You know, this happens in the ministry all the time, over somebody or in the leadership. Look what happens. In verse 36, Acts 15, 36, after some days Paul said to Barnabas, let us return to visit the brethren in every city which we proclaim and the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, call Mark along with them also, but Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to work. And this argument breaks out among them. This is an honest argument that breaks out among them. <clears throat> There's a conflict. Uh... Then in verse 39, and there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another, and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord, and he was traveling through Syria, to Syria and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. Now the churches are growing at, at, at just, so you see, this is all about the church. You see that? Acts is about the church. 
I don't know how we missed that point. It's about the church here. And then look at chapter 16. Okay, Galatia. They returned to a far district, faithfulness of the church in Galatia. They, they returned back to Galatia. And now Timothy joins them here <clears throat> in the first five verses. Paul came also to Derby and to Elystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek, and he went and he and he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconia. And Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because the Jews who were those, in those parts where they all knew that his father was a Greek. <clears throat> that was the only reason he did it, not because he had to. Okay? If we go on, <clears throat> and now we see in Asia, in the forbidden area, Europe, and the chosen area, the, the call, the call, the, the call to world evangelism, changing the cradle of society. It's literally, this is where it takes place, right? We're now at the crossroads of history taking place here in the history of the church. Uh, in verse 6, they passed through uh, uh, Phrygian and Galatian regions, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. They were not allowed to go there at that moment. And after they came to Mysia, and they were trying to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them to go there either. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and a man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to them, and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen this vision immediately, we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And we see this just unfold right here. Okay? Um, then from there, they go on to Philippi, uh, which was a, a, it was a chief city. Uh, this, in fact, Philippi is where Luke's home is, okay? Um, this is where he is, and, and this is Europe's first convert. Look at it, verse 12. <coughs> it says, And so putting out to sea, Troas ran straight across to, to Samothrace, and on the day following to Neapolis. And from there they went to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and were staying in the city for some days. And then, look, there's the preaching takes place there. Um, there's a woman there named Lydia from the city of Thy Thyatira, cell of purple, fabric, and worship of God, was listening, and the Lord opened our heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And we see here, <clears throat> the sovereign work of God's salvation, this is the work of the Holy Spirit, right, uh, is unfolded here in verse 15. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us, and that's where they stayed. <clears throat> And continuing in Philippi, we now see a display here of the teaching of the Word of God, the power of sin and uh, money versus the power of Jesus' name. We see it is going to be played out here in verses 16. Um, Paul and Silas go to prison. We see this because of this. Um, in verse 16, it says, It happened that as they were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl having a spirit of divination met us, who was bringing her master's much profit by fortune, and following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, These men are bond servants of the Most High God, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. And you know, and this goes on and on and on and on. And you know, later on, we know Paul rebuked her, right? Remember that? And then uh, that created a big problem. And so what happens? They get put in jail. Is what happens in here. Why? Because they're proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and he, they wind up going to jail here, right? right? And then we can see here, uh, uh, and, and then about verse 25. You, you, again, we know the story of the Philippine jailer, right? We know that story. But, but why is he there? Because of the preaching of the gospel. We see it in verse 25, and look what he says here. But uh, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praising God to the prisoners who were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison house was shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone in the chains were unfastened. And we know that story, right? Because it goes all the way down to the end. It goes down to verse, uh, go down to verse 31. Uh, it says, <clears throat> actually in verse 29, uh, he says, and he called for the lights and rushed in and trembling with fear that this is the jailer. He fell down before Paul and Silas and said, and after he brought them out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And we know the famous verse. And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You and your household shall be saved. You and your household, right? We know that story. But the story continues, okay? 
uh, and it goes all the way down to verse 40. Um, look at verse 35. And now when the day came when the chief mentor sent the pillagemen saying, release those men. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the chief masters have sent to release you. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. And Paul said, no, 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 buddy. Mm -mm. You put me in here for the wrong reasons. You come out here and take me out. Look what he says in verse 37, Paul, saw to, Paul said to them, they have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans, and have thrown us into prison, and now they are sending us away secretly. No, indeed. He said, in other words, he said, no way, Jose. <clears throat> no, indeed, but let them come themselves and bring us out. And we know the rest of that story, there, right? Then we get to chapter 17 in Thessalonica, okay? Uh, which is really a really important city here, and the message and turn the world upside down in Thessalonica. They get there, <clears throat> look at this. You see, it's really difficult to study out the epistles of uh, Galatia, uh, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, okay, and then First, Second Thessalonians, okay. If you've not gone through the where, how does if you don't study the beginnings of its roots, and that is the book of Acts. This is the reason why I told you that this is where it gets explained and it's applied. Those truths that were taught in the life of Jesus, okay, are now being applied in the life of the church. And we see that in verse 17, <clears throat> chapter 17, and now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and, and Apollonia, and they came to Thessalonica where they were, where there's a synagogue of the Jews, and we know that the preaching begins to take place there in chapter 17, <clears throat> as well as in Berea. Uh, because we see it very clearly here in chapter, um, in verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and they arrived, and they went into the synagogue of the Jews there. We know that he encountered great difficulties and conflicts there uh, as well in, in Thessalonica. <clears throat> Berea was a receptive city. He gets there, look at verse 10 <clears throat> to verse 15, and, 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 and it says in verse 12, um, in fact, the famous verse here in verse 11, 17 11. And now these were more noble minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether things were so. They weren't examining miracles and signs, they were examining the scriptures okay, to find out if this was so. Therefore, many that believed, along with a number of the prominent Greek women and men, men and women. So we see this exploding here. It continues here. Okay? Uh, then they get to Athens. Athens is the great intellectual center of the world at that time. It's a big uh, intellectual philosophical city. We see this being played out there, the preacher's urgency, and all of the different audiences that are presented to him. And who is it that needs the gospel? But Paul lays this out for them starting in verse 16, Acts 17, 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. And we know that what that happens in this encounter, it goes all the way to verse 21. Okay? Um, then in verse 22, uh, he continues here in verse 22. He's preaching to the heathen people in Athens here. Uh, he says in verse 22, so Paul stood in the midst of the, uh, uh, of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. Okay, look at verse 23. He says, I also found an altar with inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. You know, and he lays out, and he presents to them who God is. This is what he does here. Actually, is what he winds up doing here. <clears throat> and he goes all the way to verse 34 in this whole section. Then we get to chapter 18. Okay? Notice the structure of the book. Notice how it flows. <clears throat> okay? This is the church expanding exponentially. We are seeing now the Great Commission. The Great Commission is being unpacked and unfolded for us throughout the book of Acts. We see in the chapter 18 here, we see uh, in Corinth now, this is a bridge of Greece, okay? It's an indisputable Christian uh, here in the first 17 verses. And, and he goes to Corinth finally. And after these things in chapter 18, verse 1, after these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all Jews to leave Rome. And he says here, and he came to them, and because, because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working for by trade, and they were tent makers. And we know the great story that begins to unfold with this couple here in Corinth. Okay, and we see it here. Um, it's laid out for us very, very eloquently. And look what he says. Um, 
in verse 7, then he left there and went to the house of a man called Titus Hustus, uh, uh, Hustus, a worshiper of a God whose house was next to the synagogue, okay, and we know that story gets unfolded there. Then we pick it up again here in, in verse 18, Jerusalem and Antioch, the journey back, and, and we see it here starting in verse 18. It says, And Paul, having remembered, remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria, and with him were Priscilla and Aquila. Okay? And they go with him. It goes down to verse uh, 22, um, in verse 21. But by taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills, he sent them, he sent, he sent sail for Ephesus. And when he had landed in Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. So now he's visiting these churches. They continue to grow. They continue to be strengthened here. And then starting in verse 23, uh, we begin to see here um, the third great mission of Paul to the Gentiles, to Asia Minor and Europe. Asia Minor would be uh, what we would call modern-day Turkey uh, is where they are. And this whole section goes from uh, um, Acts chapter 18, verse 23, all the way to Acts chapter 21 to verse 16. And we now, we, we now enter here Ephesus, okay, which is really the marketplace of religion here. We see it here starting in verse 20 and verse 23, where it says here, And having spent some time there, he left and passed successfully through the Galatian region, and Phidia strengthening all the disciples. And now a Jew named Apollos and Alexandria by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the scriptures. And we know that story of Apollos here. It begins to be unpacked for us here. Then we get to verse, then we get to chapter 19. Um, here a revival breaks out in Ephesus here. Uh, so you notice that all the cities that we have mentioned now so far through the book of Acts here are these epistles that, get, that we find after the book of Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and so forth, okay? And we begin, and Thessalonica in the books of 1st uh, and 2nd Thessalonians, okay? So we're beginning to see, so if you go into those epistles and you haven't gone through the book of Acts to understand how these churches were birthed and how they came together, okay? Then you're lost as to what the arguments were in those, in those, in those books later on. And so this is what we begin to see here, uh, Ephesus in chapter 19 from verses 1 all the way through 20. And then we, 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 ha we know that because of the preaching, a riot breaks out there, okay? And we, and we see that, okay? Because why? It really bothered the people and the authorities there, uh, starting in verse 21. And now after these things were finished, Paul purposed in the spirit to go to Jerusalem. And after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And then we see, uh, and having sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered with him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. But about that time, look at verse 23, occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. In other words, Christianity. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who had made silver shrines, and we know the story, okay? They had all these idols, these silversmiths were making these idols, and what happened? People were turning them in. They were coming to the Lord. They were coming to the Lord, getting saved, they were getting rid of all the idols. They're getting rid of absolutely everything, and this creates a riot in the city, okay? And we know that story there. Why? Because of the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ again. Then we go to chapter 20, okay? And we see a great revival breaks out here <coughs> as a result of this. We see this great revival begins to break out uh, because of what? The proclamation of the, of the gospel <coughs> of Jesus Christ. <coughs> we see this in the first 12 verses as it breaks out. It says on verse uh, 1, and after the uproar it had ceased. Remember the riot? Finally broke down. Okay. They ended the riot finally. <coughs> It says this, and after the uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and when he had exhorted them and taken his leave, he then he left to go to Macedonia, okay? and he goes on to preach in all, he goes and he visits all these cities in between, all these cities in between, um, we can see that very clearly here, all the way to verse 12, and then from there, um, he goes to, uh, to Troas and to Miletus, okay? Starting in verse 13, he, 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 and again, notice that he's strengthening the church, he's preaching the gospel, and finally we get to down to verse 17, and we begin to see here, okay, and that is a, a picture of compromise inside of the church, okay, and this is where Paul has his bitter experience 
because now he's finally gone full circle, literally, and come back to Jerusalem. And this is where the struggle begins now. The, very similar to what happens in the church today. Paul's reluctant decision at this point, okay? Why? Because it's a picture of compromise for him. And that really, that really irked him. And this is Acts chapter 21, verse 17, all the way to Acts chapter 23, okay, verse 11, this entire section. You know the problems that we have in the church today? These are nothing new. We see it again being displayed here. Look at what begins to take place here uh, right before our very eyes, starting in verse 17. From Miletus he went, he sent to Ephesus and called him the elders of the church because he has to call the elders in, right? Because now they got heresy, false teachers, all kinds of things are broken out here. Verse 18, and when, they, and when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day I set forth in Asia how I was with you the whole time serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. How did I not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable teaching you publicly and from house to house the word of God, the truth of the word of God? And how can you guys have allowed all this nonsense to come into the life of the church? Okay? And he begins to deal with this issue about compromise, and that's exactly what happens. People, be, people will try to wear you down, okay, when you just accept the level of mediocrity. And this is what you begin to see being played out here in, in this whole entire section of Scripture. Look at verse 25. And now, behold, I know that all you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. He says, I'm going. Therefore I testify to you this day, I am innocent of the blood of all the men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose, the full counsel of the word of God. And I think that's what every preacher is going to have to come to bear in mind. You did not cease from preaching the whole counsel of the word of God. My hands are clean. That's what every preacher ought to be able to say. Okay? I'm not responsible for the results. You're not responsible for the results. 